Therefore, it's now time for member statements. The member from Lambton Kent Middlesex. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. This year, we are celebrating Canada's 150th year as a nation. It is a history that has been shaped and coloured by the richness and diversity of our landscapes, our wilderness, and our wildlife. I want to mark this year's National Wildlife Week by celebrating an organization which is promoting both awareness and conservation of our wildlife. The Salt Haven Wildlife Rehabilitation and Education Centre is a grassroots non-profit organization that started out in 2004 near, near Mount Bridges in my riding of Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Since then, they have cared for more than 1,000 injured and orphan animals and birds each year, enabling them to regain their freedom and return to their natural habitat. Founder Brian Salt and his dedicated team of volunteers have treated everything from an injured great horned owl to an orphan mallard duck to a poison red fox. Through their community outreach programs, Salt Haven educates and inspires diverse audiences, introducing people, especially young people, to their local wildlife and helping them to better understand the role we each have to play in the health of our ecosystems. Speaker, I want to thank Salt Haven, their volunteers and supporters for the tremendous impact they have locally and for helping to preserve Ontario's proud natural heritage. During National Wildlife Week, I would encourage everyone to seek opportunities to learn about local wildlife and perhaps to rediscover an appreciation for nature and the outdoors. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statements? The member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. Last week, I had the pleasure of attending the opening of a new exhibit dedicated to showcasing the contributions of the Polish people to Canada. Just in time for Canada's 150th anniversary, the University of Windsor's Letty Library and the Polish-Canadian Business and Professional Association of Windsor have teamed up to showcase the Polish-Canadian commemorative exhibit, a Canada 150 tribute and celebration. Speaker, despite having Polish roots myself through my husband's family, while visiting the exhibit, there was still much I learned about the extent of the contributions by Polish people. Did you know that my community of Windsor had a recruitment centre for Polish people during World War II? Or that one of the first members of, Canadi of Canadian Parliament was a of Polish descent, Alexandre Edouard Kierzkowski? Some members may remember the exhibit dedicated to Mr. Kierzkowski that was on display at Queen's Park last year. The Polish-Canadian commemorative exhibit features eight displays presented in three categories, including the contribution of Poles to Canada, why Poles are grateful to Canada, and the contribution of Poles to the world. I would like to thank the Polish-Canadian Business and Professional Association of Windsor, and in particular its president, Jerry Baricki, along with the University of Windsor for making this possible. If you didn't have a chance to visit the official opening of the exhibit speaker, you're in luck. The exhibit will remain on display this week, and I would invite all members of this assembly to come to Windsor and learn more about the contributions of Polish people to Canada. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Beaches, East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. You know, every day as I climb the centre staircase to come into this legislative chamber, I take a nod to the, the carving of Agnes MacPhail's head in the lobby. Now, you may have seen, Speaker, over the weekend that the Bank of Canada has availed a new $10 commemorative banknote for Canada's 150 celebrations, and the front of the bill features portraits of Canada's first Prime Minister, Sir John A. Macdonald, fellow Father of Confederation, Sir George Etienne Carter, James Gladstone, Canada's first Indigenous Senator, and Canada's first female Member of Parliament, Agnes MacPhail. MacPhail was the only woman in Canada to be elected to the House of Commons in 1921, the first year in which women got the vote. And she was once described as the most important woman in public life that Canada has produced in the 20th century. In 1943, MacPhail returned to politics, winning the provincial riding of York East in Toronto, an area that encompasses my own riding of Beaches East York. With Ray Lucock, she was one of the first women to become members of Ontario's legislature. Now, every year since 1993, there's been an award ceremony, ceremony held in honour of Ms. MacPhail. The Agnes MacPhail Award recognizes an East York resident who has made outstanding contributions as a volunteer by thinking globally and acting locally, an expression that she coined. This year's winner was Patrick Rocco. So I want to say congratulations to the wonderful group of people that lobbied hard to see her her face on the honoured on the $10 banknote. A special thank you to Lorna Krawchuk and all the time she puts to make sure Agnes MacPhail's award is held every year. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Further members' statements. The member from Lanark for Athletics and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, last week I tabled a property rights motion in the House. 
which would add two sections to Section 7 of the, Can Can the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and it reads as follows. The following section is inserted after Section 7. In Ontario, everyone has the right not to be deprived by any act of the Legislative Assembly or by any action taken under authority of an act of the Legislative Assembly of the title, use, or enjoyment of real property or any right attached to real property or of any improvement made to or upon real property unless made whole by means of full, just, and timely financial compensation. And that this section refers to any act of the Legislative Assembly made before or after the coming into force of this section. It also adds a second section that this amendment may be cited as a Constitution Amendment 2012, no expropriation in Ontario without compensation, and reference to the Constitution Acts of 1867, 1982 shall be deemed to include a reference to the Constitution Amendment 2012, no expropriation in Ontario without compensation. Thank you, Speaker. Well done. Thank you. Further member statements? The member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I believe that the Ministry of Transportation Provincial Highway Sign Policy discriminates against small northern communities like Alba in my riding of Nickel Belt. Before the four leaning of Highway 69, very thankful for it, drivers would see the directional sign that says Alba was only three kilometers off the highway. They would come into town, grab a bite to eat, do some grocery shopping, even spend the night at one of the beautiful lodges like Preskill Cottages or Beau Sejour Inn. Now, with the four-leaning Highway 69, the new directional sign of the highway does not list Alba. It lists Noelville, which is 30 kilometers away, and Sturgeon Fall, which is even further. No motor to motorists, it looks like you have to drive at least 30K before you can buy food or gas. That's not the case. RDH Mining, which is an international mining equipment manufacturer, wrote me to say, it was hard enough to get customers to find our location as it was. Now that this omission from the sign to our community, it will be an even greater challenge. Right now, many businesses, from mining to forestry to restaurant, grocery store, lodging, they're all losing business in Alba because of the Made in Toronto sign policy that makes no sense. This needs to change, Speaker. The people of Alba, the businesses of Alba, the motorists traveling Highway 69 trying to find Alba, deserve a proper directional sign on Highway 69 directing them to this community. It is that simple, Speaker. Thank you. James is Thank you. Further members' statement? The member from England to the Lords. Thank you, Speaker. I want to talk about a remarkable school in my writing. It's John Polanyi Collegiate Institute, which is at uh, Lawrence and the Allen Road. Uh, this was a school that was previously known as Bathurst Heights. It was closed uh, during the Mike Harris days, but reopened under the name of the John Polanyi Collegiate Institute, named after the Nobel Prize winning physicist John Polanyi, U of T. It is now up to a thousand students. It's a thriving school with all kinds of incredible, unique programs. It has an outstanding principal who's won uh, Canada's Outstanding Principal Award, Eamon Flahat. And uh, he has brought in a partnership with the Rotman School of Management. So grade 11 and 12 students have the opportunity to take business leadership. Uh, which teaches them integrated thinking. Uh, it offers uh, the Toronto School Board's only science, math, and robotics program. The school is a hub of activity and recently uh, hosted the uh, Grade 7 and 8 Girls uh, STEM Conference. It is a school that is very uh, active not only in academics but very good in sports. It has one of the best basketball programs in the City of Toronto and is very good in archery and in other track and field teams. Anyways, this is part of the revitalization of Lawrence Heights. This school is a real gem, and uh, young uh, students come from all over central Toronto to go to John Polanyi. And congratulations to the teachers and the uh, students and families at John Polanyi Collegiate. Thank you. Further member statements? The member from Perth Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, earlier this month, the Atwood Lions Club celebrated a milestone, their 60th anniversary. I was fortunate enough to join the celebration on April the 1st. Also in attendance was the club's charter president from 1957, Derek Nin. The Atwood Lions Club is part of Lions Clubs International, a global service organization with over 1.4 million members. Its founder, Melvin Jones, had a vision of giving back to his community and beyond. 
Indeed, Melvin Jones' uh, personal motto was, you can't get very far until you start doing something for somebody else. By extension, the Lions motto is, we serve. Across the globe, Lions clubs are making a huge difference in areas like care for children, dealing with blindness, diabetes prevention and treatment, and a partnership with Habitat for Humanity. Locally, the Atwood Lions Club has been a fixture serving their community. They run a wonderful skating rink that kids and families get to enjoy every year. Every July, they also hold a hugely popular parade, barbecue and family fun fair, along with their famous elimination draw. Here's the point, Mr. Speaker. Atwood Lions Club, like so many Lions and other service clubs across Ontario, strengthens our, strengthens our community. As a longtime Lion, I can tell you firsthand, Lions are making a difference. I invite everyone to join me in congratulating the Atwood Lions on their 60th anniversary and wish them many more years of success in the future. Roar, Lions. Thank you. Further members, statements the member from Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, I had the uh, privilege on Sunday morning uh, of attending uh, uh, the Vimy Memorial uh, at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier with my colleague uh, from Ottawa Centre, the Attorney General. And, um, Speaker, it was a, a very moving uh, ceremony. Uh, we had Silver Cross mums there. We had uh, the Ottawa Choral Society, uh, violinists playing in lament. And, uh, you know, when we speak about the Battle of Vimy Ridge, we often talk about the birth of a nation and how we became co-signatories to, uh, to the Versailles Treaty. But what it really is all about is sacrifice. So that's the, uh, the memory that we honour. Uh, there have been many battles fought since then. Uh, in every family, somebody has somewhere along the line who's made that kind of sacrifice. And um, as we go forward uh, and we get to the 101st anniversary, we remember of all those who served us, uh, we must remember that sacrifice because that's how we have what we have now. At the end of the ceremony, there was a beautiful uh, moment when they released some doves. And as the doves circled the monument, the cenotaph, somehow a flock of Canada geese came by at exactly the same time. Wow. It was really quite incredible for all those people who were there. And uh, truly a surprise, uh, but a wonderful part of that celebration. Thank you very much, Speaker. Thank you. For the member statements, the member from Haldeman and Norfolk. I congratulate uh, Commander Rob Johnson, officers and sailors of Her Majesty's Canadian ship York, who recently conducted a domestic maritime exercise in Toronto Harbour. HMCS York is the largest naval reserve division in the country. It's based here in Toronto. And the training day involves search and rescue on the water, diving, treatment of casualties. The exercise involved eight boats, over 150 personnel, and observers from the Royal Canadian Navy, HMCS York and HMCS Star. 25 Field Ambulance, Toronto's Office of Emergency Management, Toronto Police Marine Unit, Coast Guard Auxiliary, St. John Ambulance, Commissioners, Great Lakes, Ports Toronto, and uh, Billy Bishop Airport. Speaker, this uh, type of training helps prepare our, uh, our men and women in uniform in case they are called upon to act in support of our municipal and provincial agencies. Special thanks to the organizers from HMCS uh, York's operations department, uh, including Petty Officer Melanzwerk, Petty Officer Saki, Master Seaman Walia, Acting Sub-Lieutenant Havayeb, and uh, this information supplied to me from uh, Lieutenant Paul Hong. To all involved, bravo Zulu. Thank you. I thank all members for their statements. It's